Judah and Tamar, how many of you are familiar with this story? Raise your hand. Some of you? Okay. All right. Very good. <clears throat> Let's take a look at it. Just one more com- one comment to make before, before we read our passage here. These unpleasant stories are in the Bible for a reason. And uh, I think it's important that we not just skip over them just because they're awkward or unpleasant, but that we take a look at them and we try to figure out what God is trying to say to us through them. So Genesis 38. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adullamite, whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Shabiz when she bore him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers, he and his friend Hira, the Adullamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to share his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance to Enanim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, If you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, What pledge shall I give you? She replied, Your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away. Taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adullamite, to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, Where is the cult prostitute who is at Enim at the roadside? And they said, No cult prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also the men of that place said, No cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, Let her keep the things as her own, or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, By the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, Please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. And Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah. And he did not know her again. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. And she said, 
What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. So, this story is in the Bible. Just some observations to make here. Judah is shown here to have a problem with lust. In case you didn't pick that up. It's interesting that throughout this chapter, that it doesn't say that he knew his wife like normal in Genesis. It says in verse 2, it has some interesting words here. It says, he saw, took, and went into her. Just almost like she's an object. We don't even know her name. We know her dad's name, but we don't know her name. And that's just an interesting way that the text describes things. She's almost, she's almost just a, an object. And we're not supposed to marry Canaanites. And he was not supposed to, but she was a Canaanite also. So they procreate and nothing else. She's just this anonymous wife that he has. And they have some sons together. Their relationship is described in just six verbs, three for him and three for her. And there's no mention of Judah mourning for his dead sons either, which is quite a contrast to the previous chapter when Ju- uh, not Judah, Jacob mourns for Joseph. He weeps and wails and refuses to be comforted. And then here, Judah loses two of his three sons and... There's no mention of him mourning for them at all. So what's going on there? That's, that's kind of strange. It seems like Judah is kind of this cold and aloof sort of lustful being. And then there's this very foreign concept to us today of kind of marriage. And it's called leveret marriage where if a man dies without children, his brother marries the widow and has a child on his behalf. So that's what's going on here. And this was a a duty, a responsibility, and even a legal responsibility at that. So if a man dies without a male heir, the brother will take the widow as a wife to have a son on his behalf in order to continue that brother's name and have someone to inherit that brother's property to kind of continue, continue on that memory and that line there. And that's not just for the brother, that's also for the, the widow there. So Tamar has a right, a legal and a moral right, to posterity and provision. But she is treated in this chapter like a pawn, kind of like an object Just like Judah's wife is not named, Judah never uses Tamar's name either. I don't know if you noticed that. He refers to her as your brother's wife. And throughout, she is more righteous than I. Just He never uses her name. It's almost like she's not even a person to him. He hears her name in verse 24, but he never uses it. She's treated like a pawn, even though she's a human being and has a right to posterity and being provided for. And so that first son was wicked, and then he was put to death. And then there's that second son, Onan. And Onan, he's, a, he's quite the despicable character. He disobeys his father, he disregards his brother, and he treats Tamar as a sex object. He doesn't really marry Tamar, he just kind of sleeps with her, all the while giving the appearance that he's fulfilling his responsibility to his brother and to her and to his father. So the reason why he does that is because he wants the inheritance for himself. He doesn't want to have to share it. So if his brother dies, the oldest brother dies, now he's the oldest. And if that brother doesn't have a child, then he is the one 
who is heir to all of the property. And it's going to go to his kids instead of his brother's kids. That's a lot of money we're talking about. And that's what's on his mind. So he outwardly accepts responsibility and gets the pleasures of marriage without the responsibilities of marriage. And I just and as I was looking at thinking about this story, I can't couldn't help but think about how pornography works too. Pornography is so rampant in our society and so easily accessible. And these women in these pictures, they have dignity. They are human beings. They have right to be respected. But they are used as sex objects behind closed doors with no strings attached. And it's just kind of a parallel there. There's a lot of men out there who probably fit that own on category quite more than maybe we would like to admit. So, Tamar is used as a pawn, and then this whole game here. And then Judah sends Tamar back to her father's house. In other words, he's treating her as if she is bad luck. He's kind of a superstitious guy. So, she married my oldest son, and he died, and then he, she married my second oldest son, and he died. I only got one son left. I'm going to be wiped off the face of the earth if I give her to this third son. He can't seem to see the sin of his sons and thinks it must be her. So I'm going to get rid of her and send her back to her father's house, which was really unusual, because if she was going to marry that third son, she would live in their house, because she's still part of their family. And their responsibility, but he sends her away. He's dismissing her while promising something else. So he's lying to her. So then there's this sheep shearing. And uh, that basically means it's a payday. And there's going to be celebrations. Judah's going to be away from home. And uh, Judah's wife is now deceased. So in verse 14... Judah tricked Tamar, and now Tamar will trick Judah. What goes around comes around. Now, what's interesting is, how did she know that he would approach a prostitute? Apparently, his lustful tendencies were not a secret. It seems apparent that she was quite aware that he is the kind of person to solicit a prostitute. And so, she takes that opportunity. Judah's lust is known. She veils herself so he wouldn't recognize her. And she puts herself in uh, the four corners there at a spot so that she would be identified as a prostitute. If she was a woman alone on the street corner, that kind of signals a prostitute. But she's pretty smart, though, Tamar. She asks for the signet on a cord and the staff in his hand. And those are both identifying markers, almost like Those function as like a signature would today. Everybody has a distinct handwriting. And so, if you have this stamp on a cord around your neck, and you want to make your mark, like almost sign your name, you would stamp that into some wax, like a wax on on a letter, and then it would show, that distinct mark would show that you approve of this contract or whatever. So it's like a signature. So she gets unmistakable proof of who this guy is. And she's got that proof in her hands. So, she gets pregnant by her father-in-law. And when Judah 
goes to retrieve those identifying markers. Kind of important stuff. You don't want other people stealing your identity and using your signature on some other contracts. But Judah, in verse 23, he wants his pride. He doesn't want to be outwitted by a prostitute. And he also, in front of his friend, wants to be known for being honest in his payments. So look, you see that I tried to pay her back, so I was being honest. But I don't want to be a laughing stock by being outsmarted by a prostitute, so let's just let it lie. I'm, I'm an honest guy, and as far as everybody else is concerned, I'm, I'm a smart guy too. Okay. He wants his pride. He doesn't want the embarrassment of what has happened. Little does he know how embarrassing that encounter really was. And when he finds out that his daughter-in-law is pregnant, suddenly the hammer comes down. How dare she? What a, what a horrible thing to do. And he orders for her the most severe punishment. He orders for her to be burned at the stake. And back then... You know, as barbaric as uh, ancient times could be, burning to death was quite harsh. That was saved for only some very serious, reprehensible crimes. And uh, according to Old Testament law, it wouldn't be this bad for her. And not only that, but he would receive the same punishment as her. So, anyways, he pronounces the most severe punishment on her. He's a, he's a harsh guy. And in this whole story here, the Canaanite outshines the Israelite. The Canaanites were considered by people even back this far as a people with religion that is going to corrupt true religion. And so if you hang out with these people, if you marry these people, they will corrupt you. They are going to steer you away from the true God. So these are people you want to stay away from. Don't get in bed with these people, whether in business or in marriage. And yet here in this story, the Canaanite outshines the Israelite. She's more honorable than he is. The way that Judah phrases it, It could easily be translated, she is in the right, not I. So, she is more righteous than I, or she is in the right, and not I. So, this is an interesting turn of events at the end here. Judah, up until this point, is just the lowest kind of a guy. He's full of lust, and he's full of pride. But here, there's a turning point. Judah owns his error and is humbled here. He recognizes what he's done and he owns it. And his pride doesn't govern him here. This is Judah's only bright spot in this whole story. But he accepts the humility. It's interesting that being the proud person that he seems to be, he didn't just secretly or quickly take these things from this messenger or whatever and insist that this sentence be carried out to cover up what he has done. And none will be the wiser. And then he could maintain that pride and Tamar would be gotten rid of. It seems like that You might have expected that to happen with a kind of guy like this. But instead, he accepts accepts what he has done. Judah, Tamar, and Perez, their child, would be ancestors of Christ. Matthew chapter 1 begins by going through the genealogy of Jesus. And it starts with Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother 
was Tamar. So right at the beginning of the first gospel, we're identifying Jesus as a descendant of this. This encounter, this story, this scandal. And our Lord and Savior was born from multiple scandals, actually. This just being the first one. It's interesting that we would hold up our our Lord and Savior and yet He would come from incest like this. You wouldn't make this up unless it were true, would you? If you were trying to manufacture a religion and you were trying to make up the Bible and just invent it, you probably wouldn't put this story in here. This would kind of undermine your credibility. It would kind of make people go, ew, gross. Who wants a Savior like that? It just kind of shows that this is, this is a true story here. This, is a, this would otherwise be embarrassing if it wasn't true. It also shows that human sin doesn't thwart God's plans. God has a plan that it's going to happen whether we are faithful to Him or not. And sin might disgrace us like it did Judah here, but it does not stop God's purposes. So our Lord and Savior was born from multiple scandals. Our Lord Himself was a scandal, even. His life as a king was nothing that we would consider kingly at all. It's nothing to brag about. His victory by death on a cross was not what any human being would consider a victory. And his salvation was not from Romans or poverty or problems. It was from sin. This is, this is not the Savior that people were wanting or people were looking for. And people rejected him. They wanted nothing to do with him. He was a scandal. God's grace itself is a scandal. If our God and Father were a proud God, grace would be humiliating. It would be a disgrace. But God is not a proud God. He's... He's a God of humility. God would, in grace, would count His enemies as adopted children. God would give His perfect Son on behalf of terrible sinners. God would forgive instead of punish us for our deeds against Him. God would count us righteous as His Son instead of us as sinners. That's a scandal. That's outrageous. And like Tamar, Christ faced the most severe punishment for what we did. Judah pronounced the most severe punishment on Tamar, even though it was his fault. And Christ faced the most severe punishment, not because of anything he did, but because of what we did. The righteous son suffers for sins that we committed against him. And this is a scandal. If you were listening to the news at all, you know about that uh, Dr. Larry Nasser, and you maybe heard some bits about some of the impact statements that were read. The far and away the best one was the last one by the name of Rachel Den Hollander. If you, uh, if you have a minute, look up, Google her name, and look up at what she said at that courtroom. There's one part, though, that I think is interesting. She's talking to the judge here. I plead with you, deliberate the sentence to give Larry, send a message that these victims are worth everything. I plead with you to impose the maximum sentence under the plea agreement because everything is what these survivors are worth. Give him the maximum sentence because these survivors are worth everything. How much 
is God worth? How much is the Son of God worth who did nothing wrong? And we deserve the maximum sentence, don't we? But who got the maximum sentence? He did. He was worth everything, but got the maximum sentence for everything. Can you imagine if Rachel Den Hollander got Larry Nasser's sentence and he got to go free and she got what he deserved? It's quite outrageous, isn't it? This is what God's salvation is it's a scandal, it's outrageous. This is what grace is. We get what we don't deserve. Grace is a scandal that shows God's epic love. And our proper response to this, like Judah, is humility. Where we say, Christ is righteous, not I. That is what it means to be a Christian, or at least one thing. I am not righteous. I am a sinner. Christ is righteous. And I need to humble myself before Him because of what He has done for me. Just like that thief on the cross who said, we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Let's make that our life's attitude. He is righteous, not I. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God, your grace to us is, is unbelievable. It's, it's a scandal to the human mind. But Lord, it's, it's wonderful. It's amazing that you would, count us, you would count us righteous even though we are sinners. And Lord, that you would make us your children even when we are your enemies. So Lord, you are righteous and not we. And help us to recognize that, to acknowledge it, and to humbly accept your grace that you've given to us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.